I purchased the game Final Fantasy XIII back in the year 2012 because the Spoonie one said he was going to review it. I played it for a few days. Actually, my younger brother told some of his friends that I got the game and they all told him the same thing. Tell him that it's going to suck. And that's what all my friends in high school said. Hey, peep the nipple. Sorry for disturbing you. Um, I'm going to be careful about that since I wear a lot of tanks. But, he, I purchased the game. I played it for a while. Got stuck on chapter, at the end of chapter 5. And, I decided to go and pursue something else. To use my time more productively for other things like meditating on what is right or wrong or my life or metaphysical things that I won't remember in months time but anything other than playing Final Fantasy 13 again now a few years later Spooning already finished his review it was like a six part review and I decided I'm going to play it again, because why not? So I decided on the first day of the summer of 2014, June 21, 2014, I was going to boot up my PS3, I was going to play this mofo again, and as of now, June the 27th, Friday, it's been six days from... Saturday to Friday, and I finally finished it. I might get started on the post game stuff. I'm gonna tell you what I think of Final Fantasy 13. It sucks, it definitely is trash. But I'm gonna tell you why it's trash in a different way than everyone else. Everyone complains about how linear the game is and how overly metaphysical and restrictive the Crystarium system is. But there's a little more depth to why this system or this game sucks holistically. Let's get started with the music because I actually know some of the composer's past work this guy is good, he's talented, what's his name? I, I looked this up in my history yesterday. I mean, in Wikipedia, but it's in my history. Masashi Hamauzu. Now, this guy did some of the tracks from Final Fantasy X, and I recognize his work because I heard some of his tracks from Final Fantasy 13 and they did strike me with a Final Fantasy 10 vibe. So he was working with Nobuo Yumatsu and he did some good work. But the soundtrack to this game is boring and oftentimes really annoying. Like the Chocobo theme. I do not want to hear some type of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic type of singing with a familiar song like the Chocobo theme. Also, the tempo to that song is boring. Uh, there's no, like, flair or twang or kick attitude to it. It was just a pretty little melody and a mid-paced tempo that really bored me. A lot of the tracks in this game are kind of boring. They're, they have a, a female's vocals in the back. Not that typical gothic choir, but just her with a, a female with a pretty voice in the background. And on the other hand, some of the better themes in the game are the ones with a swing vibe, a jazzy vibe, or a blues vibe whenever Saz is around. It's kind of a reason I like having Saz in the fray or in the picture because he is different from all these other characters in the game. And 
sometimes different is good, especially when you have a monotonous one-dimensional game like Final Fantasy 13. And on the other hand, Bartandalus' theme, that is what's up. But all that soft pop sounding music and some of the bo more boring gothic choir music, that's not what's up. Stick to the swing vibe, stick to the bluesy vibe, and stick to Bartandalus' theme, and overall the game has a good soundtrack. There aren't many familiar themes, too, outside of the Chocobo theme. The Final Fantasy theme never plays, and neither does the opening theme, or the theme when you actually win a battle, the Victory Fanfare theme. Nope, you instead get the most boring victory music ever. And... Things of this nature really make it feel like this game isn't really a Final Fantasy game, that it's lost its original directorial value. Another issue I have with the game is that when it's linear, yeah, it's a little boring, but you can blaze through it. But when Grand Pulse opens up, well, I do like a few of the dungeons within Grand Pulse. My favorite being the one with the elevators and the zombies, and I also like the town that Fang and Vanille came from, a place that's kind of like a mine. These are all interesting places that I wish that they explored more on instead of just being passing, passing directions in Chapter 11. I hate how Chapter 11 takes the dynamic of the game off. Once that linearity comes off for a split second, the enemies become unbalanced. Some enemies are easy as shit, and others are horribly difficult. I know some people quit the game when they had a battle of Vanille's summon. That was when I really started to grind my levels, and I mastered them by the time I ended up facing Bartandalus for the second time. Which I enjoyed doing, actually, because it forced me to actually learn more about the paradigms. To learn more about the town I was in, explore some of the side quests, like repairing Bakhti. That was really good. And, in general, I do like the visual aesthetic this game is going for. But... Once it drops its linearity, it loses all its balance. Which means that in this game, you're fighting between having a balanced game and having a game with dynamics in it. You can either have one or the other. It's either going to be a monotonous piece of drivel, or it's going to be unbalanced and difficult as a mofo. But by the end of the game, when I beat the final boss, when I beat Bartandalus third, and then I followed it up with fighting Orphan twice, and I got hit with the worst ending theme of all ending themes when <laughs> when everyone was unfrozen or uncrystallized, however you would call that. When all of that was over and done with, we finally got a bit of a post game. And that post game sounds really underwhelming because the only thing you can really do in that post game is level up your characters, make them stronger. They don't learn much. They don't learn any special abilities afterwards. Unless you didn't level them up completely, which I didn't. I still need to get death for Vanille. And then you can proceed to take on all the missions and fight some of the super bosses. But other than that, there's not much to it. When the game quote unquote opens itself up, it doesn't really open itself up. It shows a few new things, a few new opportunities for you to 
hone your skills, for you to challenge yourself, and to explore what would have probably been an otherwise okay or wonderful game. But aside from that, you don't get much of that. You don't get any of that at all. You just get a few, like, 64 missions, and you can fight Long Gooey. Because Long Gooey is awesome, right? He's like, most badass super boss ever. A fucking turtle. And I know there are a few other super bosses in the game. Some of them might be badass. But other than that, there's got to be more than that. Give me what Final Fantasy VII got. Where you can get some interesting cutscenes where you can explore more of the backstory behind the characters where you can add some dimension to the world of Gaia I want to know how interesting the world of Cocoon and Pulse is because I see a lot of it in the data logs but I could see a lot more you could flesh it out to the point that I'm thinking wow what a world and isn't that what a fantasy game is or fantasy in general as a genre is all about. About showing me a breathtaking new interesting world. Well how come the world looks beautiful. But I don't see any depth behind it. How come you didn't flesh them in. How come you didn't go all the way with the fantasy thing. That's what bothers me. There's nothing fantastic about this game. There's nothing to fantasize about. Like I know a lot of people are fans of Tolkien. I'm gonna tell you straight off the bat, I'm not. I don't really care for him. But people fantasize about all the hominids and the weird mythological I wouldn't say mythological, the fantasy like stuff in the Lord of the Rings. How there's things like Hobbits, elves, dwarves. Uh, is that really big, giant-like animal? Orcs too, not animal hominid. So these human-like people, and then when you get to Lord of Rings, you get some weird supernatural animals that, and they're all interesting, and it seems fantastic. It seems like a fantasy because it's a fairy tale there's so many things that we can understand but they're different enough that they're interesting well I see a lot of interesting things in the game but you don't really go into it so what's the point point? as for the combat system itself it is bad there's no doubt about it if I'm playing the whole game with one hand not looking behind the screen and getting frustrated anyway because I got killed because I wasn't looking at the screen uh, that should be a sign that there's something psychologically fucked up about me but it seems that everyone else is making the same mistake and engaged in the same sort of mind trap it feels like work when I play this game in many ways, this is a combination of all the best and worst aspects of a new RPG. No, actually, just the worst of both worlds. Because you got the linearity of newer RPGs, especially in the console market. And the, the grind-heavy repetitiveness of old-school RPGs. So, you're getting the worst of both worlds, and I don't really like that. I'll tell you this much, the sequels do look better. Originally, I thought that the sequels would be much worse, and in many ways they might be. But in terms of what I had a problem with, the linearity, the fact that the world isn't so fleshed out, and the fact that there's not much that's inspirational about it, they did improve. Oh yeah, and by the way, I'm glad they improved on the fact that originally you could die if the leader of your party dies, but you couldn't swap leaders. 
so how come these two are alive? Um, but because I died, it's a game over. I could resurrect them with Phoenix down and the Raise spell, but they can't do the same for me. Or they can't summon to like bring us all back alive. Because if one of them died and I couldn't use a Phoenix down or the spell Raise, I could just summon and everyone would be back after I finish with Gestalt mode. But it seems that that standard doesn't apply to the leader. Which sucks because oftentimes, no matter what the paradigm is, your leader is your best guy. I can remember I had to we use some weird ass party leaders for certain boss fights, including Orphan 1, because if you leave your medic on his own, it's going to take forever for a dead party member to come back. Or if you leave one of your non-leader members as a saboteur, he's going to try to inflict every status except for the status you want to inflict on your enemy. And that is annoying. The Sentinels are good, left alone to the AI to... They will give you what you want. They'll probably do a better job than you as the leader. But other than that, these are my problems with the game. Let me focus on the positives for... Afterwards... Because I just bashed in this game for 16 minutes. Let me talk about the good shit. What I do like about the game is that, believe it or not, I actually do like some of the characters. Originally, I thought Lightning was a bitch, and anyone that's ever seen me play the game has mentioned how unusually rude she is as a character. I mean, she's this character that likes to assert her freedom. And how she is no one's slave. <laughs> and yet that's pretty much all she does. She is... She played the role of the puppet three times. And each time she tried avoiding that role. Which is absurd. Three times, three games. It is weird. Okay, I don't want to bash Lightning, but I did find some good in her, despite the fact that she was kind of mean to Hope in the beginning. But then she became really warm to him, not too far or too not too long into the game. She does quickly warm up to Hope, become somewhat of an older sister or motherly figure. I'm going to say older sister figure. Cause I don't, I don't think I don't pick up a motherly vibe out of that, but she does warm up to hope. But other than that, she's kind of a dick to Snow. She's more of a mean family member to Snow. She's always decking him. She decks Fang once, and she's pretty handsy. But I kind of see the humanity in her. Even though Spoonie didn't like snow. Oh, I was talking about lighting that other time. Even though Spoonie didn't like snow, I actually liked snow as a character because his dumb, romanticized idealism is funny as shit. It's not triumphant, but it's funny as shit. And I kind of enjoyed some of the overly confident, cocky shit that would come out of his mouth. I'm thinking... That does not belong in this game. Not a lot of stuff in this game kind of works together. It all seems like a strange additive, a strange collage of post-modernity, post-modern bullshit. <laughs> I was about to say post-modernity and then string that into something, but that wouldn't have worked. It would, it, the right thing was post-modern. So I like a lot of the characters. I really enjoyed Saws, even though I disagreed with some of the actions he did, or some of the things he was about to do, and they looked stupid and made him look like a jackass. But I saw a lot of humanity in him early on. Vanille isn't as annoying as people say she is. 
And yeah, she does not every time she does anything, she always comes. She's like Ash from Final Fantasy XII in that sense. Except with Ash, it's less of an orgasm and more of a deep sigh. A deep visceral sigh. <sighs> Damn, Ash. And she always pops her ass for everything, even though she's a white girl. Makes no damn sense. But yeah, I do like the characters. I do like the interplay between the characters when lightning isn't decking someone. Because that really turns me off. And... Hey, when Fang goes into traitor mode, out of the blue, for no apparent reason. And... Yeah, when the characters are shown vulnerability, they're shown humanity sometimes in the most unrealistic ways, with the exception of Saws, for the most part. But I love the characters. I love the visuals. I love the timing of all the scenes. Yeah, it is cutscene mania, but it's not like Zenosuga, where you get seven to eight different cutscenes in succession. Skip one or two cutscenes, you go into your next destination. And I love the fact that, for the most part, it is a balanced game. They try to manipulate you into playing the way they want to, because they know that you could go on forever winning every fight just having two medics and one guy attacking. So, the time all the boss fights was that after 20 minutes, the guy casts Doom on you so that you can pick up the pace. And so that these boss fights have some modicum of possible defeats. But other than that, I do like how balanced it is. I wish... I wish every fight was different. It's too bad... All fights in this game are the same, it's just which paradigm do you use at which time, and do you need to use Libra for your dumbass assist party members? That's about it. Some fights are different, like, uh, Reigns, I think. Not Sid Reigns. There's this one guy that you fight him on the prod clod for the first time and you don't stagger him because if you stagger him he uses powerful attacks and you die and that changes the whole instinct of the game because up until then the name of the game was staggering everything so that that was interesting the characters how balanced the game was the visuals it's a beautiful game I love it in that sense, but everything else needs to go away. The storyline, the plot, what you can do in the game besides the main quests, uh, some of the stupid things the characters do, or some of their dumb actions. The soundtrack is the worst thing about this game. That's all I gotta say. It's, is it the worst Final Fantasy game ever? Maybe, but it's not the worst game ever by any degree. It's not the worst JRPG ever. Trust me, Unlimited Saga is a better contender for that. Anyway, this is Mr. Wonka 7, and suck my dick.